I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. Born into the heady ether of a new sports age, he played the game above the rim, head jouncing, torso turning, stick legs pumping. He was bigger than life, a human billboard, the image of athletic perfection, the icon of icons. He was Michael Jordan, MJ, his airness. So good, so true, so completely heroic that despite the hype of his times, he just may have scraped immortality with his wings. Jordan with the steal! Jordan slams it again. Michael for three. Yeah! Oh, yeah! yeah! Jordan, look at that! Michael drives Wilkins into left for the time. Woohoo! When he came on the floor, people knew that they were in trouble. He saw Michael Jordan! Even in a game, if I see him do something like that, I would just grab my face and be like, oh my God, what did I just see? A spectacular move by Michael Jordan! His strength is like a big man. He's the strongest guard, I'm talking about body-wise, to ever play. Michael on the drive across the lane, turnaround shot, got it! 63 for Jordan! Michael was coming in from the side, and we were running down there to try to close him off, and next thing I knew, he was going by me. A courageous, classic performance by the flu-ridden Michael Jordan. Give me the ball for the last shot. I'll do it. It is my destiny to do it. I was made by God to take the last shot. Here's Jordan! Yes! In what was widely thought to be his last game in the NBA, Michael Jordan led the Chicago Bulls to a storybook ending in Game 6 of the 1998 Finals. Michael working on Russell, brings them to within one. It was one of those games that it felt like we had control of the game. And I wish I had a nickel for every time you can say that about a team that Michael played on. Along his double, they swat at it and steal it. You get right to the last second. He had the ball in that situation, and you expect the ball to go in a basket. Jordan, open. Chicago with the lead. He loves to compete and rise to that moment that is presented to him, and I think he seeks that moment. The Chicago Bulls have won their sixth NBA championship. But Jordan's dominance extended beyond the confines of a basketball court. It's hard to overstate Michael Jordan's greatness, but he has done it at a time when everything has come together. Michael Jordan is CEO Jordan. MJ, those New Air Jordans. He had all of the media exposure that the other guys before him didn't have on the internet, cable, satellite TV. Game four in Chicago, in a word, Michael. Yes, it was a national holiday. Michael did not take off, he just took off on the Knicks. He became the Pied Piper. Television ratings followed him. Fans followed him. They flocked into stores to buy anything that was endorsed by him. You better eat your Wheaties. Michael Jordan created all kinds of fans, including a lot of women fans. Please welcome Michael Jordan. Jordan, to his credit, knew that every minute he was in front of a camera was an audition for another company. Here's a black man who's the most popular person in a white society. I mean, what bigger benefit for a company can there be to cross the racial divide with a guy who's popular everywhere? Like Mike, if I could be like Mike. You think about all the things that Michael Jordan's influenced, starting with the baggy shorts, bald head, the shoes. Money's gotta be the shoes! The shoes, 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 shoes. You sure it's not the shoes? I'm sure, Mark. We see the powerful impact that he's had on our society and on our culture. Fortune magazine says Jordan is responsible for soaring revenues, an estimated $10 billion during his career. It goes across national boundaries where uh, friends of mine go to the heart of the Congo and they see kids in number 23 Chicago Bull uniforms. I thought uh, Magic Johnson was the most famous basketball player in the world still when the Dream Team went to Barcelona, and I was mistaken. Uh, Michael was big enough that there were 40-foot murals. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Jordan! Because I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, 
people like me. More than liked, Jordan was adored. But the fallout from this idolatry had its negative side. For even as public Jordan mushroomed into a global marketing colossus, the private man shrank ever deeper into a glass-walled isolation chamber. He told me once that when he walks through a crowd, even if he appears not to be looking at the people in the crowd, he can feel every eye on his skin. And he said it's like a burning feeling. Until I'm alone again, I feel the burning, those eyes looking into me. If you're Michael Jordan, and you're that celebrated and that good, the phone rings a thousand times a day with people who have ideas that they say are good for you. This is going to be really good for you. It's not good for you. It's good for them. He said, those two and a half hours on the court every game night is the most peaceful time of my day. He said, because it's like there are invisible walls around the court. It's the one part of my day that no one can touch me, no one can come up and ask for an autograph, no one can pitch a business deal. I'm meditating out there. On or off the court, Jordan guarded his carefully tilled public image. He has an awful lot of clout. And I've heard from more than one person that if you step outside the bounds of, of how he wants you perceived, then, then the word will get to you. We wrote a story about him in Sports Illustrated when he was trying to play baseball. And I think the, the story was fairly sympathetic, but the, the cover was Baggett Michael. And he, to this day, will not talk to this magazine. Whenever Michael appears in public to come down from his hotel room, he is always dressed immaculately because he knows that there are people in the lobby that maybe are going to get a 20-second glimpse of Michael Jordan for once in their life. And he wants to portray a certain image and a certain class. I'm very image conscious, probably more than I should be because I think it really prevents me from being the fun person that people behind closed doors know I am. Jordan said, a lot of times, I'll dream I'm a bad alcoholic. And in the dream, I can't stop drinking, and I'm embarrassing myself, and I'm going to lose everything. He says, and I wake up from that dream in a sweat. He knows that one slip up, one mistake, can throw it all away. And I think he lived in terror of that for a very long time. To keep from living any part of that nightmare, Jordan enlisted the media in his efforts to stay balanced on the high wire. We protected him more than I'd like to admit. When his first child was born, uh, he hadn't been married uh, yet. He says to a couple of the beat writers, including me, I really would appreciate it if you didn't put that in the newspaper. Because we know he's had the baby. It was Juanita, who you know, became his wife, and they were going to get married. And so I say, sure, Mike, I'm not, <laughs> we won't do it. And we don't. I mean, we just simply protect him because he asked us and because we were concerned as well about what the public reaction would be. Michael Jordan is the Teflon athlete of our generation. Everything just fell off of Jordan. You couldn't win any points in the media if you said or wrote something bad about him. People didn't want to hear that. Certainly when it comes to Michael Jordan, I think that we're in some sort of national denial. Everybody made money through Michael Jordan. Nobody really wants to disturb this legend. Born in Brooklyn on February 17, 1963, Michael Jordan was the fourth of five children. When he was still an infant, his father James and mother Dolores moved the family back to their native North Carolina where they eventually built a home in the seaside town of Wilmington. As a kid, he watched Roots and sort of had a vague idea of what the whites did to the blacks in our country. And I think that he said he got a little angry, but his parents wouldn't let him carry it very far. It's, you know, be better than that, rise above it. He would watch his father working around the house, and his father would have his tongue sticking out while he was working. And whenever Michael would go to work, he'd have his tongue sticking out, too. He kind of is the one that kept things going, you know, constantly uh, energetic, moving, involved, always involved in sports, always involved in activity. I'd say mischievous would be the best word to describe him. One day, Jordan's youthful confidence was shaken to its roots. He was only about 12 years old. He and a friend of his were swimming out by Wrightsville Beach. They got caught in an undertow and got swept out to sea. And his friend died. 
That's probably where a lot of his fear of water came from. I don't think he went back to the beach that much after that. If Jordan's interest in swimming died with his friend, he always had a natural born desire to outdo all comers, especially his older brother, Larry. I grew up playing against my brother, and that's the best way that you can learn competition. And once you feel like you can beat your brother, you can beat anybody. He just was determined that he was going to win. And once he started to beat Larry, then well. <laughs> but Jordan's secure sense of his athletic self was severely challenged during his sophomore year at Laney High School. He failed to make the varsity basketball team. He was only probably 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, he was the best sophomore that we had. But at the time, we really did not need a guard. He says, I looked at the list, and I went down it. I went past the Jays, and I wasn't there. And I went back up again, and I wasn't there. He says, and I ran home, and my mom was at work. There was no one at home. And I went to my room, and I closed the door, and I cried so hard. I would venture that that was the first time that Mike had ever been told he was not good enough to make a team. And it was tough, but being a competitor, that he had something to prove. Jordan accepted the challenge and starred for the JV. The next year, he stood at 6'3 and joined the varsity. By the end of the 1980 season, Jordan had established himself as a major college prospect. His coming out party was the summer before his senior year when Coach Williams and the staff recognized him at camp and then he ended up going to five-star camp and really uh, playing great. Mike came to our camp and Sunday afternoon, the first day he was there, I was running the gym, and he came through, and that night I went to Eddie Fogler, and Eddie said, did you uh, see anybody you liked? And I said, Eddie, I think I just saw the best six foot four inch high school player I've ever seen. You couldn't get a ticket to see him play as a senior. Everyone who, from 30, 50, 60 miles around wanted to come and watch Michael Jordan play. After averaging 27 points and leading Laney High to a 19-4 season as a senior, Jordan packed his bags and headed for the only college he ever seriously considered, North Carolina. He soon learned there were no easy streets in Chapel Hill. A few weeks before practice started his freshman year, I said, Michael, you're going to have to do one thing. You're going to have to work a lot harder than you did in high school. And he said, I worked as hard as everybody else. And I said, do you want to be like everybody else? Number 23, Michael Jordan. Jordan's diligence earned him the respect of his coaches. And in the 1982 NCAA final against Georgetown, with the Tar Heels down one, he wasn't afraid to pull the trigger in the final seconds. Jordy to Black. The tie, 18. Shot, Jordan! Michael Jordan! North Carolina has won the NCAA championship. The confidence and the competitiveness really grew in huge leaps and bounds after that freshman year. He competed from day one and he worked and improved his shooting, outside shooting, as uh, he kept getting better every year he played. And it nearly loses it out. It is stolen now by Jordan. Uh oh, they love that. MJ up in the rafters. Michael in the locker room before practice would point to somebody and say, I'm going to dunk on you today. And, uh, you know, it's like you didn't want to make eye contact with him because you didn't want to get picked. Jordan pulls up on a three-on-two right now. Oh, what a jam! After an All-American sophomore season, Jordan was named Player of the Year as a junior in 1984, while leading North Carolina to a number one ranking and a meeting with Indiana in the Sweet 16. Three and a half hours before the game, we have a pregame meal and walkthrough. Pregame meal's over, we're all kind of sitting there, and Coach Knight goes down a list on who has who, and he comes to Jordan, and he gets this kind of sick look on his face, and he says, Doc, it, you've got Jordan. I went back to my hotel room, and I threw up. But Dockage's defense helped hold Jordan to only 13 points as Indiana upset North Carolina. Jordan never played another minute for the Tar Heels. Before winning a gold medal that summer at the 1984 Olympics, he entered the NBA draft. I told a very good friend of mine who had a draft pick that year that was pretty high in the NBA. And I said, you got to take Jordan. Well, we need a center. I said, play Jordan at center. After two centers were selected, Akeem Olajuwon by Houston and Sam Bowie by Portland, it was Chicago's pick. The Chicago Bulls 
pick Michael Jordan of the University of North Carolina. Rod Thorne, who drafted Michael, said at the time that he's going to be a fine offensive player, but not the kind that you could build an entire franchise around. Nobody really knew how good Michael was going to be. What were the Chicago Bulls before him? Cows. You have to remember that Chicago Knights are cold, and they can be full of despair, and they can be brutal. And all of a sudden, there was something glorious right in the middle of the night. Here's a kaboom. <laughs> Unlike fasten your seatbelts, this is going to be a hell of a ride. You just knew it from day one. Earning Rookie of the Year honors, Jordan led the Bulls to the playoffs for the first time in four years. Then, with veterans Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, he lifted the NBA and the game itself to unprecedented heights. In his career with the Bulls, he won 10 scoring titles, including seven straight, and had the highest career average in league history, 32 points. He got 69 points in a game uh, against uh, Cleveland. He also had 18 rebounds. I said to my partner, do you realize we're watching a legend? This is like watching Babe Ruth. In 92, Portland had its great season, and they were going into the finals against the Bulls, and Clyde Drexler had a great season. And there was a lot of talk that Clyde would be the MVP. Before the game, Michael says, we'll show who's the best player in the league. And he gets 35 points in the first half of game one against Drexler, including six three-pointers with his famous sort of shrug. There's Jordan for three! Yes! If he wanted to do something in the game, there was no stopping what he could do. Jordan demonstrated the depth of his lust for winning when he led the Bulls against the Cavaliers in the first round of the 1989 playoffs. There was three writers then traveling with the Chicago newspapers with the teams. And each of us picked the Cavaliers to win the series before game five in Cleveland. He points to the one guy who picked him in three and he says, we took care of you. And then the other guy picked him in four, he says, we took care of you. And then he looks at me and he points me in the eye and he says, and today we take care of you. Inbounds pass comes into Jordan. Here's Michael at the foul line. A shot on Elo. Good! The Bulls win it! They win it! People have no idea how obsessed Michael Jordan is with winning at something. Not just beating you when he was in his prime, but humiliating you with putting you away, with putting you down, so that you were no longer a threat to compete with him again. Oh, and Reggie Miller came over. and Smith. All right, Michael, okay, yeah. And MJ is upset yeah. about it, and I can't blame him. Yes, sir, he ran right into him, and we got a brouhaha here. It was my mother and Michael and myself playing just a simple game of go fish or something, and I caught him cheating my mother. And I said, I said, are you that competitive? Are you going to cheat my own mother in cards? I said, you got to be kidding me. One day they fly into Portland. And the trainer notices that Michael is giving one of the baggage handlers a $50 bill. Michael says, watch this. So they get down to the baggage area, and the bet is whose baggage is going to come out first. And guess whose luggage comes out first? Number 23, he scoops up about $1,000, puts it in his pocket, looks at the trainer, winks and says, pretty good return on a $50 bet. Mom, this is the winner. Right. Right. I'm gonna get rich. Right. We just lost the Boston Celtics, but guess what? I'm winning! He is so competitive. I can remember beating him in a game of pool three games in a row and he didn't speak to me for 24 hours. Michael Jordan was on a bus and players were sort of comparing how famous they were. Michael Jordan kind of sat there. Finally, somebody said something like, I bet even Michael can't get a hold of Janet Jackson. He took out a cell phone, de -de 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 -de, dial up, said, uh, is Janet there? Uh, just tell her it's MJ, you know? Two seconds later, Janet Jackson was on the phone. I think it came from doubters early on in my life and my determination to prove them wrong, starting from my high school coach that cut me to my principal who said that I should go to an Air Force Academy to guarantee myself a job after I finished college. If Jordan's rage to prove himself inspired his teammates, it could also burn them. I've seen Michael come in a lot of times and you will knock a wall of Gatorade's cups and go off and say, if y'all ain't gonna play, stay in the locker room. Phil Jackson was never the coach of that team. Michael Jordan was the coach. Jordan was the one who yelled at them. Jordan was the one they feared. Jordan was the standard they had to live up to. Michael is just, he's killing Bill Cartwright all the time. In the locker room, in front of everybody, Cartwright 
gets Michael aside and he says, look, if you ever do anything like that again, you will never play basketball because I'm going to break both your legs. He said some things to me that I really didn't like and, um, and uh, I couldn't take it. If you let him ride you, he would ride you to the moon. He would ride you right out of the NBA and out of your mind. Phil put Steve Kerr opposite of me, but he was giving Steve all the calls. And I'm getting like really ticked off. So I started to play very, very physical. Well, Steve started giving me hard fouls. Next thing you know, I hauled off and just whacked him right in the eye. And then Phil threw me out of practice and I get home and I'm just like really hurt. They gave me Steve's phone number and I got his answer machine. And I said, Steve, I am so sorry. You know, my anger got the best of me. After every fight I've ever seen him in, he's always apologized. He never wanted to hurt you. He had to do whatever he had to do to make you raise your stakes that much higher. My mother had passed away. My first time back at work, I see this big crowd of people. Michael, Jordan, and Magic Johnson are surrounded by this pack of media. They're going one way in the tunnel. I'm dashing the other way, all alone. All of a sudden, I hear somebody call my name. I turn around, there's Jordan. He said, Andrea, I just wanted you to know how sorry I am about your mother. I was shocked. That told me more about Michael Jordan as a person than any other dealing I'd had with him in the seven years that I covered him in Chicago. What was your call on that last play? That was, uh, get the ball, Michael, everybody get the out of the way. <laughs> Go to the basket. With a weak supporting cast, the Bulls won just three playoff series in Jordan's first five seasons. Twice they were eliminated by Detroit, known as the Bad Boys for their rough playground tactics. We knew how dangerous he was, and we knew going into the playoffs that we had to do something special. And so we very definitely devised what we called the Jordan rules. Every time he came to the basket, as opposed to giving up layups and dunks because that would energize their team and give them momentum, we would rather send him to the foul line. It was important that we mentally intimidated him, whether he had to knock him down or send three guys at him or just look mean, nasty, ugly in his face. In July of 1989, Doug Collins was replaced by assistant coach Phil Jackson who had an idea how the Bulls might win. I called Michael in and told him basically what I saw as a problem with the team is that you know everything centered around him. I said, you know, the team had to share the basketball. And he said to me, you're not going to run that equal opportunity offense, are you? And I said, yeah, I am. Phil Jackson's trying to convince Jordan that the triangle offense is going to work. During the game, Jordan comes over to me at, at press row and he goes, can you believe this freaking offense? This is ridiculous. He got double or triple teamed in a game in Milwaukee and Bill Cartwright is screaming for him to throw him the ball and he says, I'm all by myself, you're double teamed. Michael felt the team had a better chance of winning if he was shooting off double teams versus Bill Cartwright or Horace Grant shooting by themselves. There was a lot of feeling that Michael Jordan didn't make his teammates better, that he wanted to score all the time, and that he wouldn't pass the ball to certain people, and there was a feeling that he was not quite good enough to win a championship. Everyone's saying that a scoring leader can't be an NBA champion. I never believed that. He came to a point in his, in his life, in his career, like, man, if I don't trust these guys, I don't think I'm gonna win a championship. And once he decided to do that, this guy was the limit for our ball club. The Chicago Bulls advance to the NBA championship round. After defeating their nemesis, the Pistons, for the Eastern Conference title in 1991, the Bulls charged to a three games to one lead over the Lakers in the finals. In game five, Jordan was faced with the ultimate sacrifice. Phil Jackson will tell you that during the huddle of the final game, against the Lakers, he finally had to get in Michael's face. I mentioned to him that John Paxson was open. Michael made a point of finding John Paxson in that fourth quarter for four jump shots in a row. And that really kind of sealed the factor that here was a guy who was willing to give the ball up at a time when he knew that he had to do whatever it took to help his team win. The Chicago Bulls have won 
their first ever NBA championship. After Michael won the first title, he seemed to say, okay, I'm just going to kick everybody's ass. There's no one out here who can stop me. There's no one here who can stop my team if I am the team player that I should be. The penultimate kind of moment for him as a leader was the last of the first three-peat championships against Phoenix. We'd won two games out in Phoenix. We couldn't finish him off in Chicago. We had to go back to Phoenix. We were straggling out to the plane. On the plane strides Michael Jordan. Can of beer in his hand, big cigar. And he stopped and he looked around and he said, anyone that doesn't think we're gonna win the championship, get off the damn plane. And he said, let's go boys. I didn't even pack for two games. Let's go out there and win this game and fly back tomorrow night. Pippen runs down the lane, dumps it out the horse, packs it for three! Yeah! Yeah! Hit the three! Because Jordan had so passionately embraced the team concept, the Bulls won three straight championships. But soon, very soon, the team would have to adjust to life without him. If you're in a room with Jordan, he's going to get up, he's going to pace, he's going to go look out the window. This is a guy who can't sit still. We're hanging together at the Olympics. We're playing cards every night. So it's 6 o'clock, the light is coming up. He goes and gets an hour's sleep, gets up, makes the 8 o'clock tea time. 18 holes of golf. Come back, scores 20 points in the first half of our game. We go back to the hotel, guess what we do? Play cards all night again. The third night comes around, and I'm sleepwalking now, you know, because I got to get some rest. Uh-uh, oh, oh, MJ, you're going to stay up all night with me. I said, Michael, I can't do what you do. To me, it wasn't a surprise that he got in trouble gambling because he goes all out. He's the ultimate chase better. Lose, double up. Lose, double up. The team won the first championship. He got invited to the White House, and Michael says he's not going. And the team's in a turmoil. On the day his team was going to the White House, Michael Jordan was, you know, in this game, gambling with one guy who was a convicted drug dealer, another guy, a bail bondsman, who was funding the game, who eventually got murdered by his associates. And then it turns out that, uh, you know, he wrote a check for his gambling losses, which is, you know, it was a paper trail he, you know, was naive about. A crack had formed in Jordan's carefully constructed facade. Six months after the Bulls' first championship, a book detailing Jordan's rough treatment of teammates and the special treatment the club accorded him hit the New York Times bestseller list. Its title, The Jordan Rules. Paxson has the flu and it's about 103 degree fever. And he, co he comes in, gets his medication, goes home. Now Jordan gets it a couple of days later, calls in, they send the trainer out to his house. In 1993, another book claimed Jordan lost a million dollars on the golf course. Meanwhile, the media, once Jordan's vigilant protector, feasted on a report that he gambled the night before a playoff game in New York. All he wanted was just some respect about the issue. Hey, I went down to Atlantic City. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't miss practice. What are you getting on me for? As soon as he went to the golf course and started losing too much money to please us, he was pilloried for, oh, is your gambling really under control there, Michael? As the story gained extended life, Commissioner David Stern was forced to take a closer look. While Jordan simmered and the media swarmed, a former U.S. federal judge was hired to conduct a league investigation. I don't think he regrets the gambling. I think he remains angry that the gambling is what people tried to bring him down on. He felt like that he had been over backwards for the media so much that it really hurt him to have anything negative come out about him. One North Carolina state investigator described the murder of James Jordan as something that could have happened to any one of us. But in this case, the shooting victim was the father of Chicago Bulls superstar Michael Jordan. He and James were alike, and they, they ran around together. They buddied up together. I have no doubt he was closer to James than anyone else in his life.
And here's his best friend and his dad gets murdered. It brought on an onslaught of absurd media attention, people trying to link his father's death to the fact that he had gambled. Everything just sort of closed in on Michael. When I lose the sense of motivation and the sense of to prove something as a basketball player, uh, it's time for me to move away from the game of basketball. I needed a change. Um, I just I just felt I was being engulfed by the success that I've gathered at that time. People were coming in and saying that this is clearly he was being driven from the league for other reasons, whether it was his gambling or something else. I laughed at the time. Two days after Jordan retired in October of 1993, Stern announced his four-month investigation had turned up no evidence that the Bulls star violated league rules. But it was too late. The following spring, Jordan tested himself in a new career. I watched him play baseball, and we met afterward, and we you know, met in the bar, and then he came to my room. We talked for hours into the night. And I was just telling him, like, what a waste. Why would you give up being the best player in the game? I think he took up a spot and a joyride and a hobby that somebody who had a legitimate chance of playing in the big leagues might have taken. He got paid to go to fantasy camp. He knew people were going to get on him. If Dad wanted to play baseball, that's the reason. Not because Michael wanted to play it so much, because his dad wanted him to give it a shot. He said, you know, I get up every morning, and I get in the car, and I look over, and my dad's there. And I think to myself, we're doing this, Pops. We're doing this together. We're going to get this done. And I think it was classic morning. His dad always did crossword puzzles. I looked up there one morning, and there he was doing a crossword puzzle. And I never saw him do one when his father was alive. Those minor leaguers were the best thing that happened to me. It was their true love for the game. And I lost that. And I found it again, playing minor league baseball. Michael Jordan is returning. He released a press release today that said, quote, I'm back. When he came back from baseball, all of a sudden you see him trying to get the best out of people. Now, instead of knocking somebody's confidence, he's trying to help them raise their confidence. 55 points by Michael Jordan. It kind of liberated him, but, you know, you really didn't know the effect of what it all meant until he won a championship on Father's Day. An emotional moment for Michael Jordan. The tears are flowing. That was a first time I realized that he wasn't there, you know, and you know, it was a very touching situation. It was very hard for me to deal with at that particular time. In his first full season back in 1996, Jordan had not only led the Bulls to another title, but a 72-10 record, the best in NBA history. He won a spot on the all-defensive team for the seventh of nine times. And by adding a twisting fadeaway jumper to an offense that once relied on power and flight, Jordan, at 33, stood alone. It's almost like he allowed us to doubt him. And then he came back and said, okay, I've shown you all that, that stuff. I've been through that. I've, I'm a human just like you. But I'm still the best. With Michael, if he's going to do something, it's not worth it for him to just do it. He has to win at it. In fact, he's taught our children that. My kids love to play basketball. They ask me to come up and watch them play one-on-one. -on -one. I tell my youngest to come over and sit down, you know, and I talk to him about being able to accept losing, but yet still competing. I say, watch, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to play your, play your brother and I'm going to show you exactly what it's all about. So I'm playing him pretty serious, and I know that at any point in time I can steal the ball and I can go ahead and win the game. But my oldest kid hit a basket, so it's 4-2. I'm saying, well, i got to get serious here because I'm really trying to prove a point to my kid. So the oldest fakes one way, head and shoulder fakes, and throws up the most luckiest shot you've ever seen, and it goes in. And I'm pissed. And I look back at my son. He looked at me and said, next. And I look, and I turn away, and I smile. I'm saying, you know what? That's my son. Because that's exactly what I would say. When we return to Sports Century, Mr. Jordan goes to Washington. basketball court you see Michael Jordan and he doesn't hold anything back as soon as he gets off the court of all things Michael Jordan becomes vanilla he's raised blandness to an art 
In 1990, Jordan refused to endorse African-American Democrat Harvey Gantt in his senatorial race against white conservative Jesse Helms in North Carolina. Republicans buy sneakers too, said Jordan. He avoided another public issue during the 1998 season, when Nike came under fire for dubious labor practices in Southeast Asia. Jordan vowed that once the season was over, he would personally investigate the factories in question. He never did. He has to do what every other elite person does that is a member of a race that's in an underprivileged situation. They have to put their money, their power, and their intellect into a system and bring about change. I think it's a little bit unfair to lay it on Michael Jordan and say, okay, wait a second, you're African American, you're the biggest icon, then everything you should do should be for the betterment of all of your people. We do this again for the second time. I am here to, to announce my retirement from the game of basketball. You know, my life will take a change. And a lot of people say, well, Michael Jordan didn't have any challenges away from the game of basketball. Well, I dispute that. More than golf awaited Jordan when he retired. In January of 2000, he endorsed Democrat Bill Bradley for president. And that same month, he became president of basketball operations and part owner of the Washington Wizards. I have an attitude about the way I play. I have an attitude about the way I win. My job and my responsibility with this organization is to see if I can pass that on to the players in those uniforms. This is his way of turning against Reinsdorf and sticking it to him. To take his celebrity, his presence to Washington, D.C., when all of his life, professionally, he's been associated with the Chicago Bulls. In September of 2001, the 38-year-old legend turned in his ownership shares in the Wizards to return to the floor for one last hurrah. Most press people, I believe, are basically opposed to it, and, on, and it's on, almost on very deeply held philosophical grounds. We want to see that shot framed in history and him never come back. In the end, it comes down to all the people who said, well, that last shot you hit to win the sixth championship game was a perfect memory. Well, that's our memory. That's not Jordan's memory. If I can do it, great. If I can't, that's great, too. But you can't take my six championships away. You can't take all the things that I've done. Michael needed the buzz and the juice of competition. I mean, this is a guy who, without basketball, ends up at blackjack tables and on putting greens playing for a couple hundred thousand dollars just to have that adrenaline rush. Nothing else in life gave it to him, so he had to come back. Jordan drives, goes to fast, he got it! He scores! Jordan scores! Makes it 87, 86! What's been impressive to me is the way that he was a very effective player, even though his physical gifts have gradually left him. He has used his mind much more uh, than his body, I think, during this comeback. The fact that he's been able to play as well as he did to score 43 points after he's 40 years old, I mean, you know, that's phenomenal. Now I can go home and feel at peace with the game of basketball. Thank you very much. When Jordan's farewell tour came to a close, not all of his teammates were unhappy. I had that guys in that locker room curse at me this year, show no respect. And Michael stepped in immediately and said, we don't treat our coach that way. All these guys who thought he took away from their games this year, they're going to find out what he brought. Sometimes be careful what you wish for, you might get it. Do they answer to Michael? Do they answer to Doug? Who do they answer to? Or do they answer to both? I just know that he had a hard time communicating with some of the players who had developed a certain status in the league and they thought maybe they weren't getting the respect that they deserved because Michael Jordan was on the team. Nobody has ever wanted it as bad as Michael Jordan has wanted it. Uh, to judge them against his own character is one of his problems. Some people even believe that I prohibit them, some of the guys from, from growing up, and, and I disagree with that. The worst thing that you can do as a manager is to fail and then blame your people for it. And that's what Jordan did with the Wizards. 
I think he kind of went off on a tangent by playing two years instead of just continuing as the general manager and try to make the team better from that aspect rather than stepping out and stepping on the floor and try to help out by also playing. I think he should have just picked one road and stuck with it. In 2003, Washington finished 37 and 45 for the second consecutive season and again fell short of the playoffs. The Wizards organization is in shambles and that's a direct result of Michael Jordan running the team for three and a half years. To a competitor, sometimes not being as successful is a great send-off you know, to know that you, know, you got to move on to do other things. That's how I looked at this. Jordan's abrupt dismissal from the Wizards in May of 2003 was not only caused by dissension among his teammates, but something that stung far worse. His work ethic as an executive was challenged. One of the prime examples, I think, is Jerry West, who was a great player, became a great executive because he would put in the hard time that was necessary, sitting in basketball arenas where he's watching people that are never going to be in the league, but you learn stuff. Jordan was never willing or able to do that. You can't picture Michael Jordan sitting back retired. I'm quite sure he'll be in Atlantic City and in Las Vegas and hunkered over some four-foot putt with uh, an ungodly amount of money riding on it. And for his sake, I hope he, uh, he finds a way to find some happiness or joy just living a normal life, but I don't quite see that happening. In his last season with the Wizards, Michael Jordan's drive to succeed may well have eclipsed his ability to lead. He reportedly refused his coach's request that he be a sixth man and threatened to make personnel decisions based on who got him the ball. If Jordan's crown had slipped because he stayed too long, his enduring image will be not of smallness, but of majesty. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Falman.